was so nervous. I was 19 and I stood on the bustling streets of Dublin, Ireland, not far from the country's uh, famous author, James Joyce. The streets were busy with pedestrians, people going to work, to school, to go shopping, and there I was ready, not ready, to share the gospel with whoever would listen. Uh, there was a group of five of us that had come over from America, and we were on a missions trip. We were gonna spend a week in Dublin doing street evangelism, cross the island, do a week in Galway, doing door-to-door -door evangelism, sharing the gospel to these people we didn't know. No problem, right? I had a microphone, so when I was on the streets of Dublin, I had a microphone, I had my big whiteboard and my marker, and I was ready to share with them how we were on one side of the cliff, and down in the chasm was our sin, and on the other side was God, and what separated us from God was our sin. The way to cross over to God was Jesus as the bridge. I had been a Christian for about a year, so I was only just learning to understand this message for myself, let alone to step into a different country and a, a different culture. Here I was in a culture that, in a nation that had a long Christian heritage. They had statues of St. Patrick um, around where we, were, where we were sharing the gospel. That was 24 years ago today. You know, I never imagined how God would use that experience to shape who I am and the importance of how I share the gospel. But could I still do that today? Could we grab a whiteboard, go on down to Barstow, or, or you know, Farwell, one of those streets, or Water Street, and start sharing the gospel? Not, not here, in, Chippewa, in the Chippewa Valley? What, what if I see someone I know? <laughs> Not here, not in Eau Claire, not in the Chippewa Valley. But, you know, I have a question for you. As you live in expectation of Christ's return, are you ready to share the gospel with those around you? Today, we're gonna be diving into 1 Thessalonians chapter two, and we're gonna look at how the Apostle Paul sought to do just that. As I shared my hope with Jesus in Ireland all those years ago and today, Every Christian should consistently model and proclaim the gospel, even in the face of opposition. Today we're gonna to talk about how to be bold, fearless, and share the gospel in love. We're studying the book of 1 Thessalonians, a letter the Apostle Paul wrote uh, after he had first visited them. Our theme this summer is hope in a hostile world. You know, we see it all around us. There's resistance to the gospel. There is nothing compared, though, to what the Apostle Paul dealt with in those ancient times. He was pretty incredible. So the Apostle Paul, he went from place to place, continued having boldness, sharing the gospel. He was beaten. He was imprisoned. He was verbally abused. But he kept, kept going. Um, Jerry shared last week about how Paul was there for three weeks, debating and bringing about uh, the argument that Jesus was the one true God. So in Thessalonica, it was a Roman uh, place, and so they would be fine if you wanna add Jesus to their list of, of Roman gods, but the Apostle Paul wasn't trying to say that. He was saying you need to just have Jesus as the one true God. That the gospel message of this, that Jesus is the Son of God, that he came, he lived, he died, and rose again to save us from our sins. Imagine that, the Apostle Paul and his companions, Silas and Timothy, and they, they had this friendship with the Thessalonica church, and they were learning about Christianity and what it was to follow Jesus. And after three weeks, Paul and his companions were thrown out. So he was looking to write back to them to remind them of how he modeled what a Christian should be in word and in their actions, and how he did that for them, because he knew that every Christian should consistently model and proclaim the gospel, even in the face of opposition. Today, as we look at 1 Thessalonians chapter two, we're gonna see how Paul modeled the Christian life for those new believers in Thessalonica, how to be imitators of Christ, and how we can still apply that to us today. 
We're going to read the first few verses in 1 Thessalonians 2. For you yourselves know, brothers, that our coming to you is not in vain, but though we had already suffered and been shamefully treated at Philippi, as you know, we had boldness in our God to declare to you the gospel of God in the midst of much conflict. For our appeal does not spring from error or impurity or any attempt to deceive. Vain. He did not come. They did not come for themselves. And it also says, suffered and shamefully treated before they had come to Thessalonica, they had been in a place called Philippi. That yet through that, through suffering and being shamefully treated, they still had the boldness in sharing the gospel of God. As imitators of Christ, we are called to be bold. See how Paul, he's sincere in his boldness. For example, if you know someone who's caught in addiction, you want to confront them, right? You want to help them, and it doesn't matter what rejection you'll have because they are headed down a dead-end road. You're willing to risk that rejection, right? Because you believe in what you're asking of them. That's the kind of boldness that Paul is talking about and trying to get them to understand. What is something that you care deeply enough about that you are bold enough about? It says here that there's conflict in the midst of much conflict. There was a lot of conflict, right, when Paul was teaching them about Christianity, right? He was challenging the Roman way of life. He was telling them to get rid of those other gods and those other idols. And as we are to be Christians, we too, just like the Thessalonians, we too are called to put those idols away. From uh, when we are meant to be, we are meant to be a representation of Christ to our culture. Just as Paul was telling the Thessalonians that. We are called to be fearless, loving examples. The Bible says we are to be ambassadors for Christ and to be like Christ. Let's keep reading. But just as we had been approved by God to be entrusted with the gospel, so we speak, not to please man, but to please God who tests our hearts. For we never came with words of flattery, as you know, nor with a pretext for greed, God is witness. Nor did we seek glory from people, whether from you or from others, though we could have made demands as apostles of Christ. Now, I was telling you about my uh, story in Ireland, but that I had been a Christian for about a year. One year before that trip, I had been searching and looking for a purpose. I had tried to find my way through drugs and different relationships. I was on a dead-end road with no hope for the future. My sister had seen this dark life and the idols that I had worshipped previously, and she loved me too much for me to stay in this life of sin I was in. As my older sister, she was an example of Jesus' grace and forgiveness. She, um, she modeled forgiveness, and she was bold in sharing her beliefs. It was clear to the rest of our family that she was a Christian. Well, that summer that I was searching, um, we were going to go hang out. And we pulled up to a house, and she said, we're going to a Bible study. A what? A what? What, what do you even do there? I was uh, not happy. I thought we were going to go hang out. Well, we went in, and this young group of Christian, this young group of Christians, they actually, they were so genuine, and they welcomed me. I was absolutely shocked. They were like nothing what I assumed a Christian would be or, or what the people that I knew growing up in the strict church I had grown up in. They were modeling and proclaiming that gospel to me. That night was the beginning of the rest of my life. My sister, who had taken me to that Bible study, she had been entrusted with the gospel of God, and she fearlessly believed that message to be transformative. Do you believe that that message is still transformative, the one that Paul is sharing here in 1 Thessalonians? She knew that that message of Jesus was not for me to someday just go to heaven, but for a life changed now. That same gospel message that the Apostle Paul gave throughout the Mediterranean, that is something that we can still believe to be transformative. 
It says here that he was to please God who tests our hearts and not man, like how a good doctor will tell you what you need to hear, not what you want to hear. If we look at verse five, he says, we never came with words of flattery, as you know, nor with a pretext for greed. God is witness. Right, Paul didn't use flattery or dial down his message. He didn't ask for money and and he wasn't a burden. He didn't teach them out of selfishness. He simply came to love and serve them. This message was so important that he wanted nothing to hinder their acceptance of what he came to share. He continues in seven through nine. But we were among you, we were gentle among you, like a nursing mother taking care of her own children. So being affectionately desirous of you, we were ready to share with you not only the gospel of God, but also our own selves, because you had become very dear to us. For you remember, brothers, our labor and toil. We worked night and day that we might not be a burden to any of you while we proclaimed to you the gospel of God. Paul shares later that they were separated in thought. They were separated in person, but not in thought, right? That they had longed to see each other as dear friends. The apostle Paul is bold in sharing the gospel to them, but he's also loving, See, the relationship with Paul, the Apostle Paul and his companions in the church of Thessalonica, they longed to see each other as dear friends. The Apostle Paul was bold in sharing with them, but he was also loving. The relationship that he's, uh, he's sharing, he brings in this family imagery that, because they were so close. They were, families were very important. In Thessalonica, the, when they chose to follow Christ, a lot of times they would lose their family. And so it's such an important imagery that he's giving. So he talks about the relationship as a nursing mother. And later on we'll read, he talks about being an, an encouraging father. So many of us in the room today can relate. I'm a mother, and as a mother, I know the needs of my child. As a nursing mother, A mother will know the needs of her newborn baby and she will give of herself to meet those needs. She she gives knowing she will get nothing in return, right? The baby's not gonna give her a high five or say thanks, right? (laughs) I know, right? But moms, we know that our sacrifices receive no repayment, right? That I think every single mom in this room could go around and share you know, being a nursing mom or whatever. If you're a mom, you know the sacrifices that you have given uh, to your child and that we know that the only thanks we'll receive is watching our children grow to be strong and healthy. There's nothing like the sacrifice of a mother. It's the most exhausting and rewarding job. i tell you a story. Growing up, my dad loved trains. We would travel the country chasing trains. He had one of those big cameras with the big manual lens, and and he was looking for that perfect shot with the steam rising around the locomotive and the smoke coming out of the smokestack. And and as a young girl and a teenager, I I hated it. (laughs) It's awful. So boring. <laughs> well, eventually I got married and we had our firstborn son. And guess what? He loves trains. <laughs> he loves, loves trains. This is a picture of my dad and my son several years ago. And ever since he could hold that plastic Thomas in his hands, he was hooked. He loves trains. So guess what every family vacation revolves around? Trains. Guess what his favorite Christmas gift is? Trains. And guess what takes up a third of my basement? Trains. Trains. You know, I I look at that face and I would do anything for that sweet smile back then. As a mother, I know the needs of my son and my other children, and I will, 
and I will meet those needs. I, I gave then, I continue to give of myself for them and making sacrifices. Loving my son and other children means sacrifices. It means caring for them and putting their needs ahead of mine. You know, and so in this letter, the Apostle Paul, he says that they were willing to give as a mother because they really cared. And that's what we wanna remember. Every Christian should consistently model and proclaim the gospel, even in the face of opposition. So remember, Paul was not only bold, but loving. We can know the gospel. We can go down to Barstow or Water Street and set up our whiteboard and share what we know. But if we have not love, we fail. The Apostle Paul shares in another letter um, that he wrote to the Corinthians. And he says, if I can fathom all mysteries and all knowledge, and I have a faith that can move mountains, but if I have not love, I am nothing. As we wait for Christ's return, and we are sharing the gospel in this hostile world, we must also be loving. There's an old hymn from John 13 that has Jesus' words. They will know we are Christians by our love. If you are bold when you're sharing the gospel, without love, you can be harsh, and not many people are going to listen to you. However, if you're loving and not bold, you love them and you let them stay in their sin. As I told you about my, my life of sin and living a life away from God, what if my sister never said anything? What if she loved me but wasn't bold enough to share this gospel she had been entrusted with? If you aren't bold enough to share the truth and you're only loving, you won't change lives. If my sister hadn't taken that step, I may not be up here today. Every Christian should consistently model and proclaim the gospel even in the face of opposition. God calls us to do both, to be bold and loving, to be full of grace and truth. In the Great Commission, in the Great Commission Jesus tells us to go out into all the world to share the good news. <laughs> what could that even look like? The person you're thinking of right now that you might wanna share the gospel to, they could be pretty resistant, to put it mildly. If you think you could go out and do it, and if you think that you couldn't go out and do it, you're right, you can't. You need a stronger power. You can't go out and share the gospel in your own strength. When I was in Ireland, I had met a young woman about my age, and I was able to share my story with her, and she ended up accepting Jesus. I was amazed because I knew it wasn't me that was speaking, but through God's power, she understood my fumbling of words, and she knew how sincere I was in this life-changing message. I can't even remember what I said, but she knew it was genuine. Why? Because in Acts, it says, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the end of the earth. When you take that step to talk to the person about the gospel, if God is nudging you in that direction, if you prayerfully and sincerely approach someone, you will receive power. You will receive, the word here is that dynamite power. The Greek word is dunamis, and that dynamite power. Now dunamis doesn't mean an explosive power, but a releasing tremendous energy, power, might, and enduring strength. I don't know about you, but I could use some of that dynamite power when I have to share the gospel with someone. We've talked about being bold and loving as we share the gospel, but remember this. You could be the only Bible that someone ever reads. If you claim to be a Christian, remember you're being watched. People around you are watching for what you say and they're watching your actions. The Apostle Paul talks about in his letter that he modeled for them what a Christian should be. So let's look at our last passage here. You are witnesses, and God also, how holy and righteous and blameless was our conduct toward you believers. For you know how like a father with his children, we exhorted each one of you and encouraged you and charged you to walk in a manner 
worthy of God, who calls you into his own kingdom and glory. The Apostle Paul shows us that leadership in being a Christian isn't about power and influence, but healthy relationships, humble and loving community. He says here that his conduct was blameless. Paul gives the example here as a father, be encouraging. You know, earlier, Paul had shared about being a nurturing mother, and here again, he brings in that family imagery of a father. A father exhorts his children. He spurs them on, urging them to continue the very good work. So just the Apostle Paul, he was encouraging them to continue doing their work among the other people. He was really thankful for the Thessalonians, how well they were doing, and he was encouraging to them. You know, maybe you're a new dad in here and you have your child is learning to take their first steps. So you know what it is to encourage them as they go. And even when they fall, right, you say, get up, keep going. Or your son just started baseball this year and teaching and having them up to bat. And you're watching him up to bat and you're having, make sure you hold it just right and watch for the ball and encouraging through that. Maybe you have a teenage son and you're trying to encourage him to go get that job, you know? <laughs> you got it. <laughs> so we are always encouraging our children. So Paul brings in that imagery here that he wants to encourage them to keep going on in their walk while he is away. In another letter that he writes to, in, uh, to the Philippian church, he says, whatever happens, conduct yourselves in a manner worthy of the gospel of Christ. Then whether I come and see you or only hear about you in my absence, I will know that you stand firm in the one spirit, striving together as one for the faith of the gospel. Same with the Thessalonians. It's a good reminder for us today. How are we doing? Are we living in a way that people would believe what we're proclaiming? Got a couple of good looking pastors here. This is our lead pastor and our executive pastor. Now, what if Pastor Paul and Pastor Brian went around promoting Rogaine best selling hair loss products? <laughs> Apply once a day, results can be seen in three to six months. Do you trust the salesman? <laughs> no, the answer is no. <laughs> Why? Well, you know, maybe the results take longer than six months. Could be. But we're not going to trust a product that, that the person clearly doesn't use or believe in. Right? Now, Amanda, our care director, or Matt, our worship associate who was up here, yeah, I would use those hair care products. There must, oh, um, just remember that our bottom line of every Christian should consistently model and proclaim the gospel, even in the face of opposition. You know, we have to live in a manner worthy of the gospel. In expectation of Christ's return, how is our conduct? I think the Apostle Paul loved and modeled how to be a Christian with their dear friends in Thessalonica. You know, when I first became a Christian, it was a journey. Like it's, I said that night was the first night of the rest of my life, but it was a journey. It wasn't a quick 180. It takes time um, to, to turn away from the old ways of idolatry and to continue into the right way towards Jesus. I mean, how about us? Like, how about our coworkers? Your buddies you're going fishing with? Your friends from school or youth group that you text late at night? Would they guess that you're a Christian by your words, by your actions? Live in such a way that others will take your God seriously. Do you believe? Do you put into practice what you hear on Sundays? You know, we have a lot of hurt and lost people waiting to hear the good news of Jesus. You don't have to set up a whiteboard. You can start with a conversation. I recently heard a quote from Billy Graham and said this, there must be no discrepancy between what we say and what we do between our walk and our talk. Live in such a way that it will take your God seriously. 
Billy Graham also said that when we are what we should be on the inside, we will bring forth fruit. You want someone to believe in your God because they see your changed life. Wherever you're at on your spiritual journey, you don't wanna live a life inconsistent with the message you claim. Are you the same with your friends at school, your coworkers, as you are with your church friends? You don't want a coworker to show up at church and see you serving as, at the cafe or as a greeter and say, wow, that's surprising. Him? No, you, you want them to say, that makes sense. It makes sense by how you treat others at the office with love and respect. It makes sense that you believe in a message like this. It can be hard to imagine yourself sharing this faith, hope, and love that you have with those around you. You're here in your chair. Someone's watching online. Maybe you're watching this later in the week in your car. And you're nice and comfortable. But uh, I'm, uh, I'm asking you to get uncomfortable. You come here to listen and learn. But sharing with others can get hostile. These, these other people, they, they can be difficult to talk to. Maybe you're the one who's difficult to talk to. That's a different sermon for a different week. Well, last year, both of my parents passed away in the span of six weeks of each other. I flew out west to be with them in their last few months multiple times. If you want to know what it is to be uncomfortable in sharing your faith with someone, someone you truly care about, this is it. How do I tell my parents that they're dying and what they'd like to know where they're going to go after they, after they die in their next, in their next life. I, I struggled with imagining how to share the hope of going to heaven. I felt like I never knew enough, even being a Christian for a long time. My parents had kept their faith pretty private, but in their last months and days, I was able to have continued conversations with them about scripture, about how Jesus promised and all the things he said. You see, it doesn't have to be a stranger. It can be a conversation with someone you know. It can be someone that you're getting to know and seeing where they're coming from, learning to ask good questions. As I sat by my mom's side, I was able to read to her and pray for her. I remember later with my dad sitting with him at the hospital and how he had asked me about a passage in John about judgment and what that meant for him in the end. I looked around because surely there must be someone more qualified that can answer these questions better than I could. But God had me there. So we looked up the verses together and we were able to discuss repentance and John three sixteen, for God so loved the world that he sent his one and only son that whoever believes in him will not perish but have eternal life. And through that, God loves you and he wants you to be with him and for you just to accept the great love that he has for you. My mom and my dad, they both uh, believed. As they each took their final breaths, I'm confident that God in his mercy welcomed each of them into his heavenly kingdom. I share this story with you to let you know that with that dunamis power, with God's power, you can please God and not man. I had felt very unqualified. I'm the youngest of four, so often overlooked. And my words weren't beautifully scripted. I, I probably didn't say the right things, but God hears us. He, the Holy Spirit interprets our groans. And God has a plan for each of us. From his plan with the Apostle Paul modeling to the Thessalonians, to me sharing the gospel with my parents. He will call you too to share your hope with Christ with someone. Live in such a way that it will make others take your God seriously. When my sister had loved me so fearlessly and came alongside me, I knew I better take this God of her seriously. When my parents asked me, knowing my faith story, they knew that I had a hope that they desperately wanted. What is something that you care deeply enough about that you could be bold enough about. 
Right now, down the hall, we have about 50 volunteers serving JW Kids. JW Kids is our ministry from birth to fifth grade. We believe it's never too early to start hearing the gospel. Maybe you need to talk to someone younger to build that confidence and to practice that boldness in sharing the gospel. In Wobblers, yes, you, you hold babies, but you're instilling the love of God by praying over them and being a blessing to the parents so the parents can be in here, hearing the gospel. One of my volunteers recently said, I figure I got eight hours of sleep, I can give a break to those parents for one hour. You know, we're each in a different place where we can disciple the young ones of our church. On Mother's Day, I stood on this stage and I asked you if you would help these parents know and become like Jesus. You remember what you said? You said, we will. There is an opportunity to share the gospel right down the hall from toddlers to preschool to our school-aged kids and our Wednesday night greenhouse youth. All these kids are looking for someone to model and to share the good news of Jesus. You can have this opportunity right here in this church to share to the next generation. But here at Jacob's Well, we care about you and we care about where you're at on your spiritual journey, right? We, say, we always say wherever you're at on your journey, take steps. Don't stay where you are. Find community and get involved. God doesn't say good luck tackling, taking your chances as you take your next step. No, he's, he's there with you. How can you find your boldness? How does God reveal himself to you? Is it through scripture, through circumstance, through that still small voice? Your story is there. Find those answers so that you can be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks of you. Maybe it's praying for boldness. God, I need your help. I wanna be as bold as the Apostle Paul and the, the people of the early church. Teach me, guide me, and show me how to be fearless in sharing your gospel. We have some next steps for you. Through that boldness, God, give me three people to put on my heart this week that I can be praying for their salvation. Give me opportunities to share your purpose and your love for them. Find a mentor, be a mentor. As you become involved in the church through volunteering and in small groups, you wanna find someone that can encourage you and walk alongside you. Get involved in JW Kids as a room leader or small group leader or being involved at Greenhouse Youth. Invest in the lives of this next generation of believers. Give them that hope that they're seeking. Maybe you're thinking this is the first time hearing about Jesus as your Lord and Savior and you're saying, I want that. If you haven't trusted God, you can do that now. You can admit you are a sinner, admit your wrongdoing, believe that Jesus is who he said he is, that he came and died for your sins, that he rose from the grave and he now reigns victorious and commit your life to him. Put your faith in him. There'll be a prayer team after service um, up front that would be glad to talk with you more. And lastly, this fall, be looking out for the Alpha class. It's a safe place you can come ask those hard questions and you can build your foundation and your confidence so that you can share the gospel with others. Thank you, let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this time, for everyone who came this morning and just the opportunity that they have to, to hear more about you, for the chance to hear how to be bold, be fearless, be loving, and how we can be, have, follow you. We can model how you live. We can be imitators of Christ. God, I pray for each person here that you would be stirring in them how they can move forward in their next steps. In your name, amen.